Hey, 42 here. Time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. So what time do you make it right now? Probably every person watching will have a different answer. Not just because you watch this video at different times during the day, but also because we have to deal with different time zones, different clocks, and varying degrees of accuracy. But mostly because you bought that suspicious Rilex watch for $5 in Singapore. The idea of time existed long before clocks. So how do we define it? What is time? And what are some of the amazing and strange ways it can affect our lives? Early attitudes towards time were relatively simple. We used emotions of the sun to give us an understanding of our place during the day. Sun high, find food, kill food, eat food. Sun low, find woman, go to cave, shout at woman till she make fire. There were also the shifting seasons, which we weren't able to measure, but you would learn to follow them and predict them from the way that nature changed around them. The first instruments to make time measurements were sundials, but these were highly localised, and from our perspective as modern clock users, the times would be different each day, since the amount of daylight increases and decreases steadily throughout the year, by just over 2 minutes per day in fact. This means that a specific point on the sundial would actually be reached slightly earlier or later the following day. There were various other measures like sand timers and water clocks, but it wasn't until the early 19th century that we had reliable mechanical clocks. Still, they weren't all running at the same speed, but at that point it didn't really matter. People in every town worked to one main clock, and the bells would ring out every hour on the hour, and that's how the day would be organised. Then, when you went to a different town, you would then work off that clock, which might run at a different speed, but the difference is so small that you wouldn't notice a change. Then came along one significant technology that made us all realise that we had to sync up all of these different clocks, and that thing was railways. Imagine trying to organise a train schedule where every stop on the line thinks it's a different time, partly because of their own town clock being off, but also due to their different positions on the globe. A city like Bristol, for example, which is only a couple of hours car journey west of London, would have a solar noon, that's the point when the sun is at its highest in the sky, about 10 minutes later than London, thanks to the 2.5 degree difference in its position. So we needed a standard, or it would all be chaos. On December the 1st, 1847, time really began, with the adoption of Greenwich Mean Time, which was often referred to as railway time. Until 1880, when it became all of Britain's legal time, many clocks would show both local and GMT on separate faces. The time zones in the US became vital since the differences over such a large country were even greater. That's also where the word hello comes from. A telephone greeting needed to be adopted, rather than good morning or good afternoon, since you could be talking to someone thousands of miles away, and their morning might be your afternoon. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, actually preferred the phrase, Ahoy hoy! Imagine how much more fun the world would have been if that had stuck. Soon, each county in Britain had standardised time, and then the world began to coordinate as communication and travel became even faster. Most countries related their time to GMT time by 1929, but it wasn't until Nepal signed up in 1986 that we had a complete global system. Okay, so that's the basic history. Now let's talk about the theory. What exactly is time? Or at least, how can we define it? Well, time is really three things, or concepts that share a common name. First, it is a way to label and order events in the universe. I buy a tub of ice cream, I eat all the ice cream, I feel sick and slightly ashamed of myself. I need something that can show that buying comes before eating and then sickness and shame follow it. This is ordering, like a calendar. Secondly, it's a way to measure the distance between two events. The ordering tells me which comes first, but it doesn't say how far apart they are. If I get a new job and then a new car, will they happen two weeks apart or two months apart? And thirdly, and this one is a little more abstract, time is a medium we move through that allows us to see that changes have actually happened. The leaves turn from green to orange, wrinkles grow under your eyes, and that beer belly swells even larger. This gives us the concept of past and future. 
It's interesting that the ancient Greeks saw the future as something that snuck up unseen behind their backs, whilst the past was laid out in front of them for them to stare out into. Sneaky future, you never know what it's up to. This third concept is really important because it's the only one that requires us to have an arrow of time, a direction it moves in and never changes. The future cannot come before the present. The smoke never returns from the air into the cigarette, the milk never unswirls out of our coffee, and I don't eject that ice cream back into the tub, walk backwards to the shop and exchange it for money. That would be weird and gross. The reason many things seem strange when you play them backwards is because of entropy. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics, and of all the rules of physics, it's probably the one we are surest about. To put it simply, entropy is the measure of the order or disorder of a system. The law states that the entropy of a closed system will either remain constant or increase with time. This means that you will always go from ordered to disordered. Think about your bedroom. You tidy it, and then it always slips slowly into a chaotic mess. And say in that mess you find a chocolate bar that is a nice, ordered, delicious collection of energy, but then you stuff it into your face and that stored calorie energy turns into kinetic energy for walking, heat, and even sound for when you tread on something in the dark and scream. I told you your room was messy. At least now you know, it's not your fault, it's just entropy. Think about a coffee with milk in it. The milk will always stay mixed throughout the coffee. It will never separate, so you have an area in the cup of just milk and an area of just coffee. If it does, then your milk was really out of date and has evolved into a sentient being. But why is this? Well, it's really just probability. The amount of ways you can organise something into a useful or ordered way is much, much smaller than the ways you can organise it into a chaotic, meaningless mess. Let's take writing as an example. If you close your eyes and randomly bash letters on your keyboard for a minute, it's very unlikely that you'll make many words because there are so many combinations of letters, but only a few combinations make real words. Take the word piggy, P-I-G-G-Y. There are no other words in English made from just those five letters. Yigpi, gipig, piggy, no. One more example. Put an ice cube in a bowl of water and it will melt and you'll end up with a bowl full of slightly more water. Now, if you reverse time, you would expect the ice cube to form out of the water. But how would that be possible? How would all of those water molecules decide between them which of them had to become the ice and which would stay as water? It just doesn't make sense. Entropy is how we know that time is destined to move in only one direction. Alright, so we know that time has a direction, but what about its speed? Is time moving at the same rate for everyone and everything? No, it isn't. It's relative to the speed you are moving and by gravity. The faster you are moving, the slower you experience time compared to someone who is not moving. This is part of Einstein's theory of relativity. You can see relativity in action every day. For example, if you're on a moving train and you throw a ball up in the air then catch it, you only witness the ball moving at the speed you threw it. Whereas someone stood on the platform as the train shoots past them at high speed, watching you throw the ball in the air through the window, will see the ball move much faster because they will see it move at the speed you threw the ball, plus the speed of the moving train. Now, the problem comes when we swap that ball for a beam of light. Most of the time the speed of light is fixed. Although it can be slowed down, nothing can travel faster than it. So take the same example, but swap the ball for a beam of light. The train is moving and you throw the beam of light up in the air. So, in this instance, the onlooker would see the beam of light travel at the speed of light, plus the speed of the train. But that's not possible, because you can't exceed the speed of light. So something must have happened to the time to make up for the lost speed. Therefore, in this example, you and the onlooker would be experiencing time passing at a different rate. This is called time dilation, and it's a great excuse for being late, since you can claim that your watch was just going slower because you walk so fast. But in reality, the difference is negligible. The astronauts racing around the Earth at almost 8 kilometers per second in the ISS have aged about 0.005 seconds less than us back on Earth in the past 6 months. Gravity also affects the flow of time in the same fashion. The stronger the gravity, the slower time passes. 
So, if you were stood on a planet with several hundred times the mass of Earth for just one hour, a whole year will have passed back here on Earth. Relativity will never truly have an impact on our lives, until we can build ships that can move at close to light speed. Then you could go off on a trip to some star and come back to find all of your relatives long dead and buried, and a bill of 14 billion pounds because you forgot to cancel your phone contract. That's the physics side of things, but what about personal relativity? Why is it that your current situation affects how fast that you feel time is passing you by? One hour in a chemistry class definitely doesn't feel the same as one hour out in a bar, unless you really love chemistry or you're rubbish at drinking. When you're a kid, summer seems to stretch on forever, but as you grow into adulthood, summer is gone in a blink and you can't remember what year it is and you realise that you missed your mum's birthday again. And what about those rare moments of extreme danger or intensity? If you've ever been in a serious accident, you'll remember that feeling of time slowing almost to a halt, and it seems like you're processing everything at a far quicker rate than ever before. A neuroscientist called David Eagleman became fascinated with this idea, and with how the brain measures time. Your brain is incredibly accurate when it comes to time. Take sound for example. When you hear a loud bang, you turn your head towards the source of the sound. But how do you know where it's coming from? Well that sound comes from the source and hits each of your ears at a slightly different time, thanks to the width of your head, which is how far apart your ears are. This time difference is as little as 9 microseconds, that's 9 millionths of a second. But your subconscious brain is still able to recognise and use this information to calculate where the sound is coming from. You also track the rhythms of the day and night without needing to see the sun. This is called our body's circadian rhythm. Your brain can even measure seconds, minutes and hours passing by with incredible accuracy. Ever woken up at exactly one minute before your alarm goes off? That's no coincidence. Your brain is like a little Swiss watchmaker's house stuffed full of various timekeeping devices and possibly some cheese. Eagleman tried to test the effect of high intensity situations. The problem was you can't just go around pushing people in front of cars or dropping their pets out of windows to see how they react. So he found something called a suspended catch air device. That basically involves dropping people through a hole whilst they face upwards so that they can't see the safety net behind them. He gave each volunteer a screen on their wrist, which would flash a random number slightly faster than the eye can normally see. If they did experience time slower, then hopefully they'd be able to see the number on the screen. Sadly it didn't work, but they did note that when asked how long they thought the fall had taken, volunteers overestimated by an average of 36%, so something was happening to their perception of time. But this phenomenon still largely remains a mystery. And finally, we can't talk about time without mentioning time travel. Travelling to the future is clearly possible thanks to special relativity. All you need to do is keep travelling close to the speed of light and life on Earth will race by much quicker than your personal experience of time. Travelling close to light speed is no easy task though, it would require absolutely enormous amounts of energy. And imagine how disappointed you'd be if you got out of your ship and still no one had invented x-ray glasses or a reverse microwave to make your beer cold in an instant. Without those, the future is totally pointless. Travelling to the past is a little tricky, and we'd almost certainly need some sort of wormhole to achieve it, but it's at least theoretically possible. Having a wormhole to the past would not defy the laws of physics, even if it does lead to the potential for paradoxes, such as the bootstrap paradox. This could be where a young man travels back in time, meets a girl and gets her pregnant. He leaves because he didn't get into the time travel game to get tied down, but the woman gives birth to a boy, who ends up being the time traveller himself. He is, without knowing it, his own dad, who would make parents evening at school very confusing. So time is many things, it can be a measurement, a concept and even a way of travel. We still don't fully understand the complexities of time and maybe we never will, but in the end it doesn't matter what it is or how long it is, it's what you do with it that counts. Thanks for the view, subscribe for more 42. He had simply gotten drunk at a local pub and was walking home past the palace at 7am 
when he decided to go for a stroll through the halls of possibly the world's most famous residence. Just outside of Munich lies a sleepy village called Fugurai, where the rent for a whole year is just under one euro. 